Now we're going to move on to the fire sermon, the third movement of the poem. Uh, the river's tin is broken, the last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. Sweet Tim's run softly until I end my song. Okay. The speaker of the poem is talking about the Thames. He speaks it in a way that the river is not as it used to be in the summer. It's a scene of joy and excitement, but now it's barren. And while not clogged with trash, it's practically deserted. This is perhaps alludes to the fact that the entire generation of British young men went off to World War I and never came back. Uh, when the ones that did were severely damaged, both physically and mentally. <clears throat> um, in the second stanza, he makes a, a, a reference to Shakespeare's Tempest here. Sweeney and Mrs. Porter is a reference to another song, again, again Sweeney, another poem rather, Sweeney Among the Nightingales. Mrs. Porter was a madam and Sweeney a client. Now the portion of the poem, it goes twit, 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 jug, 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 so rudely forced to you, is a reference to Greek mythology. Philomel was the daughter of Pandy and the king of Athens. She was turned into a swallow, and her uh, sister Procne into a nightingale. Or in the Latin versions, uh, a nightingale with Procne, and with uh, Philomel was a, pro was a nightingale, and Procne was turned into a swallow. Uh, when they were being pursued by cruel Tereus, who had married Procne, but raped Philomel. And what he did, he cut out her tongue so that she couldn't tell. Um, on page 965, we have the inter introduction of Tiresias, who was a prophet in Greek myth. He's blind, but he can see the future. Now, the thing about Tiresias here, and here we're talking about the, uh, at this part of the poem, at the violet hour when the eyes, eyes and back turn upward from the desk and the human engine waits like a taxi, throbbing and waiting. I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see the violet hour in the evening, the hour that strives homeward to bring the sailor home from the sea. The typist at home at tea time clears her breakfast, lights the stove, and lays out food in tins. Now, the reason that Tiresias is speaking to us, he's uh, a prophet, both in Greek mythology and appearing here in the poem, The Wasteland, is Tiresias um, was turned into a woman for killing two snakes that he found mating in the forest. He was disgusted and he struck them with his, with his uh, walking stick to make them stop. And the gods were offended at this because he had re interfered with the natural order, so they turned him into a woman for seven years. He is brought in to comment on the action of the next part of the fire sermon. Uh, there's the story of the typist, the scene where a woman is getting ready for a date. She's setting out food. The thing is, she's putting out food in cans. She's not cooking. Right? You get the feeling she's not terribly excited about this date or this guy. Otherwise, she would be perhaps preparing something. So she's just sending out tins of food. These are, we would say cans. It's a lot of canned goods. Sorry. Um, there's laundry scattered around the place. So she's not even picked up for the guy. And then we have the introduction of the young man Carbuncular. Carbuncles are essentially pimples, zits. He's got terrible acne. So perhaps explaining a little bit why he's not. She's not terribly uh, concerned about or terribly excited about him. Um, he's not an attractive man. And what follows here is essentially a rape. Um, let me skip down to it here. The time is now propitious as he guesses the meal is ended. She is bored and tired and endeavors to engage her in caresses, which are still unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response, and makes a welcome of indifference. I, Tiresias, and I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all, enacted on the same divan or bed. I, who have sat by Thebes below the wall, and walked among the lowest of the dead. Bestows one final patronizing kiss, and gropes his, fine, gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. Okay. So, um... Yeah, it's actually a rape. The young man carbuncular forces himself 
on the typist. She doesn't resist, but she doesn't encourage him either. And he doesn't need encouragement. He, the, the poet tells us this. He, his vanity doesn't need... As long as she doesn't protest, he's okay with doing whatever he does, if, even, uh, even if she's not excited about it or aroused. Okay. So once the, car, the young man carbuncular finishes, he leaves. The typist is not traumatized. She doesn't cry. She doesn't scream. Her only reaction is akin to, well, I'm glad that's over. Now I can get on with my night. Here it says, she turns and looks, looks a moment in the glass. This is the mirror. Hardly aware of her departed lover, her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. Okay, What he's saying is she just kind of moves mechanically around the place. Her reaction isn't one of passion or, or outrage or, or sorrow. She's just like, oh, I'm glad that's done. This is a group of people, this is a generation of people who just have given up. They don't care. They don't even, they, like the young man Carbuncular, doesn't care that she's not into it. She doesn't care that um, he's having his way with her. They're just a lost and, and hollow generation. It's like he said in the hollow men here. So, uh, Theresius, the storyteller, is the storyteller because he's seen both roles. He knows what it's like on both sides, which is what it means. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all and acted on the same divan or bed. He's been through it. Lived as a woman, lived as both a man. He's seen both sides of this here. Okay, which brings us to... Um, the next movement, Death by Water. Yeah, movement four here. The shortest of the movements in the story, or in the, in the poem. And it goes, Phlebas the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell, and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bones and whispers as he rose and fell. He passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool, Gentile or Jew, O oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. In reality, though, uh, the only lesson Phlebas offers is the physical reality of death and decay triumphs over all. Phlebas is not resurrected, and he's not transfigured. Uh, Eliot further emphasizes Phlebas', Phlebas dried-up antiquity and irrelevance by placing this section in the distant past by making Phlebas a Phoenician, long dead people. Uh, what the thunder said. Things really begin to break down properly here. Uh, the previous four sections of the wasteland, Eliot had used a number of different poetic forms and meters, and although the poetry occasionally broke down into what might be called free verse, it usually regained its form after a while. But what the thunder said is overwhelmingly uh, written in unpunctuated, unrhymed, irregular free verse. It's a lack of water that has led the speaker of what the, what the thunder said and his desire for water to lapse into semi-coherent snatches of speech. Right? As if he's observing this landscape, the landscape of the wasteland, the London of uh, post-World War I London, and looking at all this, and he can't even observe rhyme anymore. He's reached a point of exhaustion and and metaphorical thirst, salvation, for a starvation, rather. Um, there's a good biographical reason for all this. T.S. Eliot wrote this section, The Last Part of the Wasteland, while he was convalescing in Lausanne, and uh, claims to have written What the Thunder Said very quickly in a sort of trance. He even claimed that uh, though perhaps with his tongue partially in his cheek, that he wasn't even bothering to check what he wrote or with, uh, was even making any sense. Right? Uh, he was in essentially in the asylum, recovering from a nervous breakdown. Much of the final section of the poem is about a desire for water. The wasteland is a solid drought where little will grow. Uh, water is needed to restore the earth to return a sterile land to fertility. 
Shades of the Fisher King myth here from the Arthurian legends. Um, along the way in uh, lines 350, uh, lines three, movement to uh, 359 through 65, um, we get a weird digression which sees the speaker asking about a hallucinated third person. He imagines walking alongside uh, his traveling companion, uh, a detail which inspired Elliot it tells us was uh, in his tells us in his notes by one of Ernest, Ernest Shackleton sorry Ernest Shackleton's Antarctic expeditions, where one of the men suffered from the delusion that there was one more man in their number, an imagined extra person. Shades of the Gothic are introduced here, which are echoed by the bats and with the baby faces in the chapel. We are also in the realms of the Arthurian myth here with the Grail Quest. The Chapel Perilous was the place in St. Mallory's Le Morte d'Arthur where Lancelot was tempted. As with the fire sermon, temptation reemerges as a theme. Can one remain spiritually pure and focused, or will the lure of the body become too strong? Okay. And what he's talking about here, too, the, the um, allusion to the Fisher King is, is well made because. In the legend of the Fisher King, the land was was in a state of drought. This was because the king was was sick, and the idea being that uh, as go the kings goes the king, so goes the nation. The two are inextricably linked, and the um, in the legend, one of the knights finds the the Holy Grail and fills it with water, drinks, um, brings it to the Fisher King to drink and he thereby heals the land okay so um and finally rain comes to the land and there's a thunderclap the sound of thunder da as analyzed and interpreted in many different ways by those who hear it, it is uh, variously interpreted as dada give diadvam sympathize and damyata control taken from the upanishads a uh Excuse me, a, a series of sacred texts important to both Hinduism and Buddhism. Each of these three commands is meditated on the lines that succeed it. So, for instance, after Dada, we find the question, what have we given? Okay, and we, there we go. Dada, what have we given? Um, followed by the reference to the moment surrender, giving or giving up of oneself. What the Thunder said concludes with a collage of quotations from various sources here. Um, the nursery rhyme London Bridge is falling down, suggesting the demise of London as the center of a vast empire and trading power. Dante's Purgatorio then dives him into the fire which refines, which refines him. The Pervigilium Veneris, a Latin poem dating back nearly 2,000 years, Followed by Tennyson, O Swallow, Swallow, a sonnet by Gerard de Nerval, the Prince of Aquitaine, uh, in the Ruined Tower, and Thomas Kidd's Elizabethan play, The Spanish Tragedy, when the finally the word Shanti, which Eliot is roughly equivalent to our phrase, the peace which patheth, un, passeth understanding, is repeated three times. So again, it ends on a fairly um, optimistic note um, that the the land is restored that the that water comes to the wasteland and he says that what he's telling us here with um with there we go the three from the the, the voice of the thunder from the the upanishads is what have we given my friend bloody shaking my heart the awful daring moment surrender which an age of prudence can never attract by this the only way of this and by and this only we have existed which is not to be found in our obituaries or in our memories draped in the beneficent spider or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. He says, what have we given? All right. In order to survive, in order to spare the wasteland, to bring um, prosperity and to restore the wasteland to, to fertility, we must give um, David, 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 sorry, David Vam, uh, I have heard the key turn in the door once, turn once only. We think the key, each in his prison, thinking the key, each confirms prison. Only nightfall, ethereal rumors, revive for a moment, broken Coriolanus. 
we have the key, we can do, we can make the change. And finally, Damiata, the boat responded, gaily in the hand of experts, sail and oar, the sea was calm, your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. We just have to do it. I sat upon the shore, fishing with the airplane behind me. Shall I at least set my lands in order? London Bridge is falling down, falling down. And then, of course, the Latin and uh, the uh, the quote from the Prince of Aquitaine. These fragments I have I have shored against my ruins. I have essentially I have taken these fragments to bolster myself up. Why then ill fit you? Hieronymus is mad again. Data. Dayavam, Damyata, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Okay? Ultimately, it's a message of hope. It's not too late. If we have the key, we must give, and we must take action. Right? So, that is T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, one of the most powerful and well-remembered remembered poems of the 20th century. So, hope you enjoyed that. Hope this helps part the waters and clarify this very confusing piece, um, this very thick, very dense piece of literature for you. All right, I will see you in the next video.